live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE. Covering ServiceNow, Knowledge17. Brought to you by ServiceNow. We're back. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. Chris Beatty is here, he's the CIO of ServiceNow. Chris, good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Yeah, so a lot going on this week, obviously. You said you're just getting pulled into a million different directions. Uh, one of those, of course, is the CIO decisions, event. Yeah. CIO decisions, it's something that you guys host every year. I had the pleasure of attending parts of it last year. Uh, listened to Robert Gates mm -hmm. and some other folks, which was great. Um, what's happening this year over there? So CIO Decisions, it's really where we bring together our forward-thinking executives. We keep it intimate to about 100, because really it's about the dialogue, us all learning from each other. It really doesn't matter the industry. I think we're all after the same things, which is driving higher levels of automation, increase the pace of doing business, and innovating at our companies. So we had Andrew McAfee, uh, MIT research scientist, really helping push the boundaries in our imagination on where machine learning and predictive analytics could go. And then we had Daniel Pink talking about his latest book, To Sell as Human, and really in CIO, as CIOs, we often find ourselves selling new concepts, new business models, new processes, new analytics, new ways of thinking about things. And so really trying to help, um, call it exercise, our, our selling muscle, if you will, because we have to sell across, up, down, and within our own teams. And so that is a big part of the job because as we move into this new era, I think the biggest constraint is actually between our own ears. Our inability to imagine a future where machines are making more decisions than humans. Platforms are doing more work uh, on behalf of humans. Intellectually, we know we're headed there, but um, you know, he helped really bring it home. Well, you know, it's interesting. You talk about selling and the CIOs. Typically, IT people aren't known as salespeople, although a couple years ago, I remember at, at one of the knowledges, Frank Slootman you know, sort of challenged the CIO to become really more business people, and he pr predicted that more business people would become CIOs. So, do you consider yourself a salesperson? I do. Uh, selling people on a vision, a concept, the promise of automation, uh, you know, technology, uh, people fear it, right? You know, when you're automating people's work, the fear and the uncertainty and doubt or what I call the organizational antibodies start to come out. So you have to bust through that. And a large part of that is selling people on a promise of a better future, but it's got to be real. It's got to be tied to real business outcomes with numbers. It can't just be a bunch of PowerPoint slides. So I always, we always like to take the messaging from the main tent and then test it with the, the practitioners. And and this year, there's this sort of overall theme of working at light speed. You and I have talked mm -hmm. about this. How does that resonate with the CIOs and how do you put meaning behind that? Because you know, working at light speed, it's like, oh, that sounds good, but how do you put meat on that part? So the way I think about working at light speed is three dimensions. Velocity, intelligence, and experience. And velocity is how fast is your company operating? And you know, I read a study that said 40% of Fortune 500 companies are going to disappear in the next 10 years. That's almost half, right? But I think what's going to separate the winners from the losers is the pace at which they can adapt and transform. And with every business process being powered by IT platforms, I think CIOs and IT are uniquely positioned to explicitly declare ownership of that metric and drive it forward. So velocity, hugely important, intelligence, evolving from the static dashboards we know today to real-time insights delivered in context that actually help the human make decisions. And BI and analytics as we know it today needs to evolve into a recommendation engine. Because why do we develop BI and analytics? To make decisions, right? So why can't the platform, and it can is the short answer, with the ability to rapidly correlate variables and recognize complex patterns, give recommendations to the humans, and I would argue, take it a step further, make decisions for the humans. ServiceNow did a study that said 70% of CIOs believe machines will make more accurate decisions than humans. Now we just got to get, get the other 30% there. <laughs> and then on experience, I think the right experience changes our behavior. And um, I think we in IT need to be in the business of creating insanely great customer and employee experiences. Too often we lead with the goal of cost reduction or efficiency, and I think that's okay. 
But if we lead with the goal of creating great experiences, the costs and the inefficiencies will naturally drop out. You can't have a great experience and have it be clunky and slow. It's just impossible. And it's, it's interesting on the experience because the changing behavior is the hardest part of the whole equation. And I almost think back to kind of getting people off just an old solution people used to say for startups, you got to be 10x better or, or one tenth the cost. You know, 2x, 3x is not enough to get people to make the shift. And so to get the person to engage with the platform as opposed to firing off the text or firing off an email or picking up the phone, it's got to be significantly better in terms of the return on their investment. So now to get that positive feedback loop and oh, this is a much better way to, uh, yeah. to get it, work it, done. It has to and we can't you know, bring down the management hammer and force people to do things. It's just not the way you know, people work. And very simple example of an experience driving the right behavioral outcome. So ServiceNow is a software company, very important for us to file patents. The process we had was clunky and cumbersome. You know, we're not perfect at ServiceNow either. Um, so we reimagined that process, made it, made it a mobile first experience, built on our platform of course, but by simply doing that, there was no management edict, you have to, no coercion if you will. We saw an 83% increase in the number of patent applications filed by the engineers. So the right experience can absolutely Change give you the right desired economic behavior. You talked about 70% um, of CIOs believe that machines will make better decisions than humans. We also talked about Andrew McAfee, who wrote a book with Eric Brynjolfsson, and in that book, The Second Machine Age, they talked about that the greatest chess player in the world, when, when the supercomputer beat mm -hmm. you know, Gary pa Kasparov, he actually created this contest, and, and they, they, they beat the supercomputer with a combination of man and other supercomputers. So do you see it as machine sort of intelligence augmenting human intelligence, or do you actually see it as machines are going to take over most of the decisions? So I actually think they are going to start to take over some r basic decision making. The more complex one, the human brain plus a machine is still a more ad um, you know, advanced, right? Where it's better suited to make that decision. But I also think we need to challenge ourselves in what we call a decision. I think a lot of times what we call a decision, it's not a decision. We're coming to the same conclusion over and over and over again. So if a computer looked at it, it's an algorithm. But in our brains, we think a human has to be involved and touch it. So I think it's a little bit, it'll challenge us to redefine what's actually a decision which is complex and nuanced versus we're really doing the same thing over and over again. Right, and, and you're saying that the algorithm is a pattern that repeats itself and leads to an action that a machine can do. Yeah. It doesn't require And we don't call that a decision and, anymore. Right, right. <laughs> so, in thinking about, you, you gave us sort of the dimensions of, of light speed. What are some of the new metrics that will emerge as a result of, of this thinking? Yeah, I don't think any of the old metrics go away. I'll talk about a few. You know, in light speed, working at light speed, we need to start measuring, for one, back on that velocity vector, what is the percentage of processes in your company that have a cycle time of zero, or near zero? Meaning it just happens instantaneously. We can think of loads of examples in our consumer life, calling a, calling a car with Uber. There's no cycle time on that process, right? So looking at what percentage of your processes have a cycle time of zero. How much work are you moving to the machines, right? What percentage of the work is the platform proactively executing for you, meaning it just happens, right? I also think in an IT context of percentage of self-healing events, where the service never goes down because it's resilient enough and you have enough automation and intelligence, but there are events, but the infrastructure just heals itself. Um, and I think, you know, IT itself, we've long looked at IT as a percentage of revenue. I think with all of the automation and cost savings and efficiency we drive throughout the enterprise, we need to be looking at IT as a margin contribution vehicle. And when we change that conversation and start measuring ourselves in terms of margin, I think it changes the whole investment thesis in IT. So that's interesting. Are you, are you measured on margin contribution? We're doing that right now. Uh -huh. I, I don't, if an IT organization is waiting for the CFO or CEO, to ask them about their margin contribution, <laughs> they're playing defense. I think IT needs to proactively measure all of its contributions and express it in terms of margin. Because that's the language the CEO and COO and CFO are talking about, so meet them in a language that they understand better. So how do you, I mean, you certainly can create some kind of conceptual value flow. 
IT supports this sort of business process and this business process drives this amount of revenue or margin. Is, but is I, so I stay away from revenue because I think anytime IT stands up and says we're driving revenue, it gets really hard because there's so many external and internal factors that contribute to that. So we more focus on automation in terms of hours saved, expressing and dollarizing that, hard dollars that we're able to take out of the organization and then bubbling that into an operating margin number. Okay, so you sort of use a, a, a use the income statement you know, below the revenue line to Correct. guide you, mm -hmm. uh, and then you fit into that framework. Absolutely. W when, when you talk to other CIOs about this, are they, do they say, hey, that sounds really interesting, how do I get started on that, or? I, I think it resonates really well because, again, IT as a percentage of revenue is an incredibly incomplete metric to measure our contribution. With everything going digital, it, it, you want to pour more money into technology. I mean, studies have shown, over, and Andrew McAfee talked about this, over the last 50, 100 years, the companies that have thrived have poured more, disproportionately more, into technology and innovation than their competitors. So, if we only measure the cost side of the equation, we're doing ourselves a disservice. Mm. And so, how do you get started on this, this path? I mean, we, let's call this path sort of what we've gen generally defined as light speed, mm -hmm. um, you know, measure it on, on, on margin. How mm -hmm. do you get started on that? Uh, first step is the hardest, um, but it's declaring that you're going to do it. And so we've come up with a framework you know, that maps at a process level, at a department level, and at a company level, where are we on this journey to light speed? If light speed is the finish line, where are we? And I define three stages, manual, automated, cloud, before you get to light speed, and then using those same three dimensions of velocity, intelligence, and experience to tell you where you are. And the very first thing we did was baseline all of our business processes, every single one, and mapped it. But once you have it mapped on that framework, then you can say, how do we advance the ball to the next level? And it's not going to magically happen overnight. This is hard work. It's going to happen one process at a time, right? But pretty soon, everything starts to get faster, and I think things will start to really accelerate. When you think about sort of architecting IT uh, at, at ServiceNow versus some other company, I mean, you come into ServiceNow as the, as the CIO, uh, everything runs on ServiceNow. That's, that is part of the mandate, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that's not the mandate at every company. Now, it increasingly may be coming that way in, in a lot of companies, but how does your experience at ServiceNow differ from sort of the traditional G2000? Well, probably the unique part about being the CIO at ServiceNow is, is actually really fun in that I get to be customer zero, in that I implement our products before all of our customers, you know, get to sit down with the product managers, discuss real business problems that all of our customers are facing, and hopefully be their voice inside the four walls of ServiceNow, and, and being a strategic partner to the product organization. Now, implementing everything, our goal is to be the best possible implementation of ServiceNow on the planet. And that's not just demonstrated by GoLives, it's demonstrated by, again, the economic and business outcomes we're deriving from using the platform. So that part is fun, challenging, and hard work all at the same time. So how's Jakarta looking? Fantastic, we're super excited about everything that's coming out, whether it's the communities on customer service, or software asset management, that's been a pain, right, for IT organizations for a long time, which is these inbound software audits, right, from other companies, and you're responding to them, and it's a fire drill. In my mind, our software asset management transforms software audits from a once a year, twice a year event to always on monitoring, right, where you're just fixing it the whole time, and it's not an event anymore. I mean, the intelligence that we're baking into the platform now um, super exciting around the machine learning and the predictive analytics concepts. We have more analytics than we had before. I mean, there's just so much in there that's just exciting. Um, we're already using it. Um, I can't wait for our customers to get a hold of it. Well, CJ this morning uh, threw out a number of 30 plus percent performance improvement. I had said to myself, well, you're saying that with conviction, that's because you guys got to be running it <laughs> you know, yourselves. Yeah, we and, are, and, what are you and seeing, uh, right? that's not a trivial number. Yeah. And I, I think the product teams have done a great job really digging in and uh, you know, making sure our platform operates at light speed. One of the things that Jeff and I have been talking about this week, and really this is your passion here, is adoption. 
how do you get people to stop using all these other tools like email and you know, kind of get them to use the system? I think showing them the promise of what it can bring. And I think it's different conversations at different levels. I think to an operator, someone who's using the email to manage their work, they're hungry for a different solution. Life working in email and managing your business that way, it, it, it's hard, right? To a mid-level manager, um, I think the conversation is maybe about the experience, how consumers of their service will be happier and more satisfied. At executive level, it gets maybe more into some of the economic outcomes of doing it, because implementing our platform, you know, you're going to burn some calories doing it. Not a lot, our time to value is, is really, really quick, but still, it's a project and it's initiative, and it's got to have an outcome tied to it. You know, Chris, as you're saying that, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's always tough to be stuck kind of halfway. You know, you're, you're kind of on the tool internally, and it's great, and yeah. unfortunately, the we app. We don't use the word me, tool. No, it's a tool, the <laughs> app, the platform, actually. Uh -huh. <laughs> but, but then you still got, you got external people that are you know, coming at you through text, email, et cetera. I mean, it's part of the vision, and maybe it's already there, I'm not as familiar with the product as I should be, in terms of enabling kind of that next layer of engagement with that next layer of people outside the four walls to, sure. to get more of them in it as well, because the, the half-pregnant stage is, is almost more difficult because you're, you're going back yeah. and forth between the two. And our customer service product does a lot of that. If you look at what Abhijit showed today, which is fantastic, communities is another modality to start to interact with people. Certainly we have a Connect, part of our platform is a collaboration app within the overall platform, so you can chat just like you would with any consumer app in terms of chatting capabilities and that mobile first experience. So, and I, we're thinking about other modalities too. You know, should you be able to talk to ServiceNow, just like you talk to Alexa, and converse with ServiceNow? Farrell touched on this a little bit right. through natural language, right? And we all know it's coming and it's there. It's just pushing in that direction. How about the security piece? You know, Sean shared this morning, you, know, you guys are well over a year in now. Um, and he talked about that that infamous number of 200 plus days. Nine you know, months, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, compressing that. Are you seeing that internally in your own? We are, we, we, use, we use Sean's product. Uh, we're a happy customer. The vulnerability management, the security incident response, and very, very similar results. And just like the customer who was on stage, said, go live and iterate. And that's exactly what we did, right? Everyone has a vulnerability management you know, tool, like a Qualys, that's feeding in Right, bring in all those call alerts. Our, our platform will help you normalize them and, and just start to reduce the um, level of chaos for the SOC and IT operations. Then make it better, then drive the automation. So we're seeing very similar benefits. How do you manage uh, the upgrade cycle? We've been asking a lot of customers this week on the upgrade cycle. Some say, ah, I'm do, I'll do N minus one just to sort of let the thing bake a little bit. <laughs> you guys are like N plus one. Um, <laughs> how do you manage that in production though? Sure, so we upgrade before our customers, um, and that's part of our job, right? Yep. To make sure we test it out before our customers. But I'll, but I'll say something in general about enterprise software upgrades, which is there, there is a cost to them, and the cost is associated with business risk. You want to make sure you're not going to disrupt your business, so there's some level of regression testing you just have to do. Now, strategies I think that would be wise are automating as much of that testing as you can through a testing framework, which we're helping our customers do now. And I think with some legacy platforms, that was incredibly expensive and hard and you could never quite get there. Us being a modern cloud platform, you can actually get there pretty quickly to the point where the 80, 90% of your regression testing is automated and you're doing that last 10 to 20% because at the end of the day, IT needs to make sure the enterprise is up and running. That's job number one. But that's, that's a strategy we employ to make upgrades you know, uh, as painless as possible. So that's got to be compelling to a lot of the customers that you talk to, that notion of being able to automate the upgrade process. I mean, I mean For you're sure eliminating a lot of time and they can count that as money. I mean, It, it, it is money and, and automating regression testing, it's, it's a decision and a strategy, but the investment pays off very, very quickly. So there's, a, there's an upfront chunk that you have to do to figure out <laughs> how to yeah. make that work. Yeah. And then, Just like anything worth doing. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Excellent. What's, what's left for you at the show? What's left for me, I, I love interacting with customers. I got to talk to a lot of CIOs at CIO Decisions. I actually enjoy 
walking through the partner pavilion and meeting a lot of our partners and seeing some of the innovation that they're driving on the platform. And then just, you know, nonstop, I get ideas all day from meeting with customers. It's so fun. It's great. Chris, thanks very much for coming to theCUBE. Thank appreciate you. Appreciate seeing you again. Good, Good seeing you. you. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Jeff and I will be back with our next guest. This is theCUBE, we're live from Knowledge17. We'll be right back. Thank <laughs> you.